Howdy, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. It's the Canadian Bowler Podcast, episode number 25. Daryl, can you believe it? we're on 25 already? Uh, I can't believe it. It it seemed like uh, a bit of a, a chance when we, we started the show that we would even make it out of a, a couple shows. We'd give it a try, have some fun, and, and just see where it went. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, pretty happy we're here. I mean, especially after the year we've had uh with uh the pandemic and no bowls to report on or even speak about so yeah pretty happy we made it this far yeah it's crazy to think that um, we've been able to find stuff to talk about um, have some really interesting conversations with uh guests and with um you guys the viewers when you when you come into our chat and ask questions and, and make comments it's been fantastic i mean i can't i can't say that it could have been any better unless we actually had bowls going everywhere <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it's been nice. Uh, the last couple of shows here, we have um, a little bit of news to talk about. Unfortunately, it's no good news, but we do have some news to talk about today. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, I guess we'll follow the or cover the basics here, guys. Uh, remember to like, follow, subscribe if you're new here. Uh, hit the little notification bell so you can tell every time we go live. Uh, if you can't make it for the whole show, uh, don't forget that we're available on all major podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. So if you need the, to do that, we're there available for you. I think we just passed 500 downloads on our podcast a couple of weeks ago. We did. So uh, keep on doing that. It really uh, helps us out. We love the support. Uh, the thumb, little thumbs up there and uh, the comments and stuff, uh, they uh, they really do uh, make us appreciate. or yeah, We appreciate all of them, and it uh, makes us want to come back and keep doing more. That's absolutely right. And, and so you guys know, it seems like a little thing, um, doing the subscribe and like and share and all that but it, it really is the way that we get seen it's the way that we promote this show uh it's just us two no budget um doing this as a passion project because we love bulls and we love talking about bulls so uh that little bit of help just helps us so so much you have no idea yeah absolutely um, I guess we'll start it off with the most uh, local news that we have, Daryl, with um, Bulls Canada announcing the cancellation of the 2021 National Championships. Yeah, um, I, I don't think this necessarily came as a surprise. Um, a lot of countries are, are canceling things. There's the rarities of, say, like uh, Bulls Australia, who are currently putting on pretty big events and getting back on, I guess, back on track as much as they can. Um but for countries like Canada, like the U.S., who who canceled theirs a little while ago, that's just uh, that's just what we have to deal with. Uh, Canada's rolling out vaccines. Canada's got some hot spots still, and um, doing a national championship is probably just not not the right thing to do at this time. Yeah, I'm happy that they uh, decided to go ahead and do it early. I mean, rather than delaying the inevitable, unfortunately, um, I think it was the right call by Bulls Canada. Um, obviously i'm a little bit upset about it i'm sure a lot of people are but there's not really a whole lot we can do about it and i don't really think that there was any other option other than to cancel it this year um i mean that's not to say that there's going to be no bulls in canada this year i believe um in the article that they released it did say something about uh supporting clubs and um whatever they're trying to do bulls wise so um obviously not everything is going to be canceled clubs can still run whatever they can run um I believe there's probably still going to be an opportunity for clubs to be able to run tournaments, assuming the year goes better than last. But uh, who knows? Yeah, uh, I think the theme is um, kind of stay local, play local, support your for clubs. Sure. After last year, your clubs need your support. Um, any money that you can um, kind of funnel towards your clubs, doing club tournaments, jitneys, just playing around, doing your membership. Um, everything is good towards helping your local community and, and getting that club back on track. And then hopefully we can look to, you know, uh, 2022 to uh, get back to something a little more normal. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it's crazy to think that I haven't rolled a bowl in almost what's going to be rolling around two years here shortly, um, which is crazy because I've played, I don't know, a couple days a week at least every summer since I was seven years old. Right. So in the last 20 years, uh, so it's a little strange to to be going this way for two years in a row, but I mean, it is what it is, I suppose. 
Yeah, um, for me, being around during the summer and uh, having free time um, to do other things, it, it's been interesting because, like you said, I've, I've been bowling for so long, and every weekend, a couple times during the week, I've been bowling, uh, taking my vacation to to bowl as well. It's it is a strange feeling. Um, I am missing it a ton. It was it was kind of nice to have a break for a little while, and I thought, you know, hey, this isn't so bad. But now I'm I'm really ready to get back on the greens. Yeah, last year I guess for me it was kind of nice, um, just with me stepping away from the national team and kind of uh, lowering my uh, lo workload of bowls, I suppose you could say. It. Um, so it was kind of nice uh, to just kind of walk away from the sport for a little while but i am definitely missing it at this point and i would would have loved to get back out there and at least play a little bit but i guess we'll see what happens a couple things in chat here uh, uh regal portraits back again uh hi from sydney vancouver um john seitman it's unfortunate but not unexpected our higher case count and slowly getting through the rollout is tough i suspect we'll be able to get back to it next season uh we miss uh will miss all my bulls friends and he says Fortunately, because of the age, or maybe that's unfortunately, uh, because of the age eligibility, uh, I'll get one last year uh, at the U25 next year. That will be one of the big goals for my Bulls development. So fortunately, he gets to still be in the under 25. And unfortunately, <clears throat> things that have an age restriction, people might miss out on. Yeah, I missed, uh, I missed out on my last year, um, last year. Bless you, Daryl. I think you're sneezing. Um, but uh, yeah, I missed out on my last year, the under 25. Um, it was going to be here at my home club, uh, in Peterborough. And I was really excited to go out there and try and uh, win another national championship. Uh, but it is what it is. John, I hope I hope that you are, are able to go fight for that title one more time. It's a great event that I think anybody under the age of 25 in Canada should be playing in if I can, because it's so much fun. Uh, it really helps get your name out there if you're looking to pursue some sort of a bowls career. So what do you think about, um, not just for Canada, but for probably anywhere that, that has these restrictions that um, possibly uh, you can't move county to county or province to province. You might just have to play within your province or maybe even within your community. Um, I think it's a, if clubs use it the right way or provincial organizations use it the right way, even Bulls Canada and other places, if they use it the right way, this can be an opportunity to revamp what we're doing you know take a look at the old uh charts of of tournaments what's working what's not what makes sense um there's so many uh events out there that clubs rely on is there a better way to do it that clubs aren't so heavily dependent on trying to get as many people out every single day of the week uh to tournaments and just you know basically running people uh ragged trying to keep these things going or is there more exciting better things to do like the opl kind of format for other provinces getting interclub stuff going again so there's there's that you know sense of community pride and and really uh showcasing say hey it's toronto versus peterborough versus kitchener and all that kind of stuff uh that can make it a little more exciting it's definitely a tough one to <clears throat> kind of uh dissect and kind of figure out what uh how really i feel about it because it's so different uh even just from city to city and province to province right like here in ontario daryl you know um we're pretty lucky that if you really wanted to um, on a regular season you could bowl every single day in a tournament i think probably um weather permitting because there's so many tournaments going on then you go other places like uh i know in saskatchewan they only have a couple tournaments a year outside of their provincials yeah um, so there's not a whole lot going on out there. So they're basically stuck only playing club play. And um, I think that's pretty well it. Um, I'm not sure about, I know in BC, they have a few tournaments a year. I'm not sure if it's anything like ours. And uh, I guess John could answer me about how it is over there in the East Coast. But like I said, I'm not, I'm not too sure how it works everywhere. But um, I think uh, just being with the off season, I think there's definitely an opportunity for things to be looked at and um, maybe uh, condense a little bit. Uh, because it is pretty oversaturated, I think, in Ontario, um, just yeah. with how much is going on. Like, there's um, so many tournaments, and some on some Saturdays, there's probably 10 or more clubs running a tournament in Ontario. So are you really going to get that many people out? Maybe. Probably not. Who knows? <laughs> um, I think it's also a really good opportunity for clubs that don't 
have websites or good websites or any sort of social media presence just to to work on that with your your time off um i'm not it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to run a website so i mean it's definitely an opportunity for clubs to um put out some sort of website or make a twitter or facebook page even because everyone's got facebook right and um use those sort of opportunities to help your club grow um i mean we're in the digital age now if you don't have a website in my opinion you're kind of behind um i think a lot of clubs do have websites but a lot of them are not good like i know in peterborough our club is okay or sorry our website is okay but it's not great again i can't speak for every club i don't know yeah. but i think uh, just in the age we're in i think you pretty much have to have a website i think it'd be really easy for um for tournament entries um and just posting stuff online because posting stuff online is how everybody sees stuff now. That's true. I mean, we can speak from just this, uh, this stream and podcast. We use social media to try to get um, everybody's attention right before we're going to go live um, to showcase a lot of our videos and clips and stuff uh, from this very, very show. Without that, it would be very, very difficult. You know, what are we going to do? You know, word of mouth, trying to get, uh, you know, pamphlets out there saying, hey, come check out our YouTube show. Um, and and you're absolutely right with the, the websites and the digital presence. Uh, there's a lot of clubs that kind of got on board with the website, made one, and then just forgot about it. And you can, for myself, if I'm going to go to a new club and I don't know where it is or what it's about, I'm going to go see what it looks like, maybe where it is, what do they have to offer, so I know what to expect. And sometimes they haven't been touched in like 10 years. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look at some of the, some of the places in uh, Canada that have great social media presence, like uh, the Nutana Bulls club in, in Saskatoon, I get stuff from their Facebook page all the time. Mm -hmm. I know, uh, I believe it's probably, I believe it's John Seitman who runs all the stuff in, in Halifax and the Dartmouth club. I see all their stuff on Facebook all the time. And like, I don't, I don't live there. So why do I need to see that? And that's a good thing that I, that I'm seeing that I'm not yeah. saying that in a bad way at all. Uh, so shout out to the people who are running their page the right way. But I think that, like I said, I just think there's an opportunity here for, uh, to clubs to kind of revamp and build more of a presence online. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think Regal Portraits just said it, right? Totally agree in 2021, it's a learning curve, but worth it. This this is an opportunity for clubs to do something different, to add to their portfolio of ways to attract members, to showcase their club, to showcase the game, you know, post videos, um, get more up-to-date stuff on the web as far as what their club looks like, what they're running, who, they're, who their people are. And... Um, just a, a word to everybody, make sure you update, make sure you keep those updates coming because uh, we Absolutely. want to know what's going on today, not what's happened a couple of years ago. <laughs> hey, and if you do have exciting updates on your page, don't be afraid to send it to the Canadian Bowler and we can highlight it on our show and then we can play it out on our show. So if anyone's traveling in the, in the future and wants to go to your club, maybe we'll have a little guide for them and point them in the right direction. It, that's an excellent point. We, we want the news from you guys. Uh, we scour to try to find news articles. We scour to find uh, big things to talk about. And, you know, uh, feed us what you want to talk about. Feed us the, the news about your club or something cool that you're doing or uh, big events that you're, you're looking forward to, whatever it is. Um, we want to know about it, and we'll be happy to uh, do something on the show to either uh, present that event that new thing that you're doing or uh, promote whatever, whatever is going on. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I guess we can move forward here. We don't need to be so depressing and talk about the cancellation <laughs> of a season. Let's yeah. talk about um, the recent news that I believe it was Bulls Australia put out, Daryl. Uh, talking about the 2032 Olympics, uh, where they are hoping to push Bulls into the 2032 Olympics. What do you think about that, Daryl? Uh, that was interesting. Um, I, I didn't expect to hear something like that. I know World Bulls had said a while ago that they were petitioning uh, the, the IOC to to get Bulls into the Olympics. Um, Bulls Australia is a powerhouse. It's a huge part of our Bulls community. Obviously, you see all the live streams, all the stuff that they're doing, which is a little bit ahead of most other countries, I would say. Um, big events like the BPL and the UBC and Aussie Open, you name it, they're doing it. They have awesome clubs out there. They have a great presence as far as Bulls clubs and, and the community. This 
this is the opportunity. If they're going to try to host the Olympics and they're going to do it uh, in 2032, give it a shot. Um, I would love to see it in there. It would mean so much to other countries. It would mean so much to bowlers all over the world. Why not, right? Uh, I got a question. Do they know where the Olympics is in 2032 yet? No, they're making a bid, I believe. Like Australia is making a bid? I believe so, yeah. Okay, I don't I know if it's that. been announced. I say that because I believe if the Olympics happened to be in Australia and Bulls happened to be in the games, I think that would be probably the best possible thing for the sport simply because it's the biggest there. And uh, if you were there like you or if you watched it on TV or online, how the Commonwealth Games were in Australia, how those stands were packed mm -hmm. and how many people showed up to watch bowls. I think if people seen that in the Olympics um, in Australia, it's going to just show it to so many more people because how many people watch the Olympics, right? Like when you watch the Summer Olympics, Daryl, you probably watch like diving and cycling. One yep. other time ever have you ever went on and go, I'm going to watch diving today. No, it's true. Uh, the Olympics kind of opens your eyes to other sports. Um, there's stuff that I've watched um, day in, day out, and really got interested in where uh, I had absolutely no idea either the uh, the sport existed or that it was so intense or so interesting. And I wouldn't have have seen it if it wasn't for the Olympics. Come on, Daryl. When have you ever watched the two and a half mile speed walk before? <laughs> Never. I, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And if people will watch speed walking, I think people will watch bulls. And yeah. if they see if they see how big um, the crowds are, if it's in somewhere like Australia, like I said, I just think it'd be a good starting point um, for it to be a staple in the games going forward. Yeah, so John's putting a few things in here. So Brisbane is the preferred host uh, that the IOC has designated. So they haven't been kind of slotted but they're preferred uh the other two ones considering a bid with the ioc behind it uh brisbane is the most likely uh if we had our sport in the games the endless access to promotion and of course the potential funding to our athletes is huge it would be big for our hb program uh oh and greg repeated some of the same things but <laughs> you win this round john <laughs> um what can i say the commonwealth games uh i was i was able to go there in uh, uh 2018 when they were on the Gold Coast, they did a fantastic job. The the venue, the access, the camera work, the the crowds that were there, it was unbelievable. And the Olympics is just that much bigger. The crowds are that much bigger. Uh, the people that go there and want to actually just take a look at sports, get tickets and say, ah, oh, you know what, I got a ticket to Lombos. Let me go and check it out. More eyeballs is just better for us. And what John said, um, for the high performance program in any country, it means a huge deal because now you're accessing funding for Olympic sport, not just Commonwealth sport. It's that next tier of our sport is legitimate worldwide. Just on another note, how crazy is it that the Commonwealth Games were three years ago? Yeah, it seems weird, <laughs> eh? Yeah, it seems like it just flew by in a, in a, in a flurry. This, this down year of... Uh, kind of staying in your house and staying local and not really traveling or doing anything. Um, it just, it, it didn't seem to be that long. It just kind of all blends together. So it's, it's a really strange thought to think, oh, you know, the Commonwealth Games is kind of coming up. World Bulls has passed and it's been delayed. Uh, it's just so many things going on. That's yeah, crazy. But yeah, uh, Olympics, huge. Uh, if Bulls Australia, if anybody can do it, Bulls Australia can do it. I think they have the backing and the uh, the support of their communities and their their giant Bulls clubs. Um, it it would just be another tier for our sport, and I think it just opens up a lot more doors to say, hey, we are an Olympic sport. You can see us. You can watch us uh, in the Olympics. You can watch us in the Commonwealth Games. All these avenues, and. Uh, Hopefully that funding just allows uh, Bulls associations to do that much more for the sport. I also think it's going to drive um, more people who are maybe not quite on the full-blown competitive side of the sport to kind of want to get into it more. Because like I've said this in previous shows, but who doesn't want to be a, a friggin' Olympian, right? Like how cool would that, how cool would that be? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I get asked all the time when I play, or when I say, hey, I coach internationally, let's say, um, like, oh, have you ever been to the Olympics? Or is your Olympic sport, where can I check it out? And I'm like, we're not in the Olympics, but Commonwealth Games is that peak moment for us. It's a huge event. And it's sad to say, but um, there's a lot of sports, um, especially in the Commonwealth countries, where the Commonwealth Games is that tune-up for the Olympics, where it's, I'm going to compete against a ton of people that are the best in the world. Um, but I'm looking to say, this is where I'm at today. And the Olympics is where I want to win that gold. So uh, for us, it would it would be nice to have that. Commonwealth Games is amazing, but Olympics is just that next level, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John says, it's going to be nuts next year with uh, the Com Games and the Worlds at the same time that's uh yet to be seen they the dates are pretty close together in the in the same year whether world bulls is able to run after commonwealth games and if countries can actually attend both that would be interesting to see i'd say for sure um want to move on to bpl sure yeah let's do it all right uh bpl 12 uh, wrapped up just a little while ago for those of you who haven't seen it the videos are online we have a preview that you can check out uh, that kind of gets uh, we were hoping that would get people pumped to actually see uh, bpl 12. It, it was a blast i had fun watching it obviously some of the games were either a little too early in the morning uh or at times when i was working that kind of thing uh but i tried to catch as much as i could um, I had to watch the finals later because what was that like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning? For yeah, us? and uh, yeah, something like that. And I just want to say uh, I called who was going to win in our preview <laughs> show. It didn't. Get, it didn't actually make the final cut. No, but we did have um, sort of a talking um, section in there where we did uh, uh, some some picks, and I I happened to win. Uh, we didn't bet any money on it, unfortunately, or else I'd be stealing Daryl and Mike's mm -hmm. money. But. I will I will have to uh, pull that clip of us making our predictions and I'll post it as a sound clip on our Facebook page uh, or maybe our YouTube or or even our uh, uh, audio podcast just so your uh, your evidence is out there but he did uh, Luke uh, picked the Ospreys who won BPL 12 um, Ospreys had a had a great team Corey Wedlock um, Chloe Stewart and Aaron Tees um, Aaron played phenomenal um, I'll just give a shout out to him. He was he was amazing uh, through the whole competition. It's just like it's so hard for for me to like not understand why you wouldn't pick them. Like they're just a star studded lineup from top. I mean, I guess top to bottom. It's only three people, but um, from top to bottom, right? So uh, there, are, if you've never heard of them, they're a bunch of young up and coming players who are just dominating the sport in Australia and worldwide. Um, so just people to look out for. And I just thought, hey, it looks like a good team. And they do. Um, I I picked uh, the Roys, um, Aaron Wilson, uh, Carla Krasanek, and uh, uh, Rudiger. Uh, is it Wayne Rudiger? No. Uh, who did they have on there? Couldn't tell you. Oh, I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, good prep. Uh, I, I picked the Roys. I thought they were an awesome team. Uh, and they didn't do so well. There was another team, uh, Sydney Lions, who looked really, really good. And uh, I think that was uh, Ben Twist, Karen Murphy, and Aaron Sheriff, who, I mean, if you're going to say uh, who's who of people bowling, that's a good team. Yeah, it's and, pretty, and, pretty, pretty solid. And they struggled. But I do want to give a shout out to uh, one of my favorite bowlers to watch uh, in the BPL, Scotty Solborn. Uh, he got the MVP for the season. He played phenomenal for the pioneers who were actually in the final uh, against the ospreys and uh you know shout out to him he played super well unfortunately he didn't um make it up and the royce matt uh, matt flapper i uh man i was drawing a blank okay. on flapper so yeah uh and that's a, i thought that was a fantastic team and it is yeah Right, and, but... and uh, I thought my pick was down the drain after the first uh, couple of days I watched. And uh, I'm not, I, I might be the Melbourne Pulse, the team that was skipped by Gary Kelly for the event. Yeah. Um, that team looked incredible. They were basically running show uh, or for a little while. They had, um, who was on that team? Uh, there was the guy with the Flava, not Flava, Flav, but the Riff Raff Dreadlocks, uh, Barry, Barry Lester. Lester. 
<laughs> yeah. Barry Lester and um uh Oh crap, who was who was the other person on there? Was it Ellen Ryan? John, who was on that team? But anyways, they looked really good and I thought they were gonna go all the way, but they did not. No, and they were I wanna say they were eight and or nine and oh before they actually hit a loss. They were they were on a, a roll and uh just taking names. Um yeah, and it was Ellen Ryan, so you were right. Uh, they were they were playing phenomenal, and you thought, uh, you know, who's going to knock them off or, or who's going to go, and they didn't make it into the final. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't watched the BPL, if you uh, don't know what it is, go and check it out. It is a phenomenal event. Um, I would love to have something like that in other countries as well. Um, this time they didn't have international players per se. They had those internationals that were living in uh, Australia is like a, a Gary Kelly or a Ryan Bester, but those guys that they usually bring in, like an Alex Marshall, let's say, um, those guys weren't there, but the teams were phenomenal. Even the ones that um, got picked up to fill those spots, fantastic. Yeah, there's some great games, and not even just on finals day. Like I said, I think one of my favorite games I watched was uh, when the Pulse played against the Murray Steamers. Uh, just the battle up front with Ellen Ryan and Caitlin Inch, two of the premier female singles players in the world in my opinion mm. uh going head to head and then ryan bester and gary kelly two absolute bangers in the back end uh so it was fun to watch it was and uh this can kind of lead into uh chatting a little bit about the ubc uh john brought it up uh the ubc is is also the um uh planning to run events uh this year i think their events are going to be run they're doing a qualifying event for a team to qualify to enter the UBC, which is the Ultimate Bowls Championship, uh, for those that don't know. Um, the UBC will be running, I think, uh, a week in August where they'll do three events, and then a week in December where they'll do three events. They're trying to um, take what they missed due to the pandemic and canceling events and jam it into the later part of this year and make it just a huge uh, UBC kind of festival explosion kind of thing, I guess. Um, that's going to be exciting. There's some really, really great players. Uh, as John mentioned, the the team that won, or the, the, the Pulse, who was doing super, super well in the BPL, had won, I think, the inaugural event of the UBC, which is uh, Gary Kelly and uh, Barry Lester as part of that team. They'll probably be back. And um, it'll be interesting to see how the UBC does. Um, they they were pulling in a ton of international teams, but I don't think that's going to happen. They haven't updated their team uh, profile page, so all those teams are still listed. But they're not going to have enough international players to actually fill those teams, I don't think. I mean, it'd be really cool if it's a possibility for that to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, for, like for examples, there's a ton from um, Asia. So there's Bulls Asia Dragons, Bulls Asia Eagles, Bulls Asia Tigers. Uh, I think there's even one, the Hong Kong qualifier. So they were supposed to have a qualifier for them. Um, in Canada, there was, well, I guess North, North America. American team, yeah. yeah, North American team as well. So um, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of those teams will play, but it'll be interesting to see what teams are playing, what uh, players are in there and just how how exciting they can make that event 100% yeah um, I think we have another special little thing for all of our our viewers out there right are you talking about the interview I, I think I'm talking about the interview what are you talking oh, about the interview I think I'm talking about the interview I think we're on the same page here just <laughs> kidding we're totally on the same page we have a an incredible interview, uh, one of my favorite ones um, that we've recorded um, so far. It went really well. I'm excited for you guys to watch. Uh, that's with Catherine Rendall of England, uh, who recently did very well and played in the uh, Potters Championship since she was seven months pregnant. Uh, it's quite the accomplishment. And she tells us a little bit about her story and her backstory and what her future goals are in the sport and a few other things along the way. So I hope you guys enjoy. All right. Well, Catherine, first off, I wanted to start it off by saying uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, we've I've read a lot about you and seen a lot of your things <laughs> online. So it's uh, pretty cool to get to speak to somebody that you've seen so much online. Um, oh, no worries. Thanks for having me. 
The first question I, I like to ask people is uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, for people who might not know you um, and how you got into bowls and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. So I've been playing bowls since I was about five. Um, my dad um, has played for England for over 20 years and played Commonwealth Games himself. So um, he ran the junior section at our, our local club and I just joined in sort of from the age of five, really. Um, so that was me and then won my first national at about six, age 16, I think. Um, wow. And then, yeah, just enjoyed enjoyed playing ever since, really. That's that's incredible uh, to to be so successful at a young age uh, is amazing. Um, but before we, we get into everything, first uh, I just wanted to congratulation, uh, say congratulations on your pregnancy. Uh, how oh, how far <laughs> along are you right now? Um, quite a long way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I was thirty six weeks yesterday. Oh wow! Um, so not long to go now. So uh, what's it been like? Uh, dealing with the pandemic and uh, expecting your a child during this time as well? It's been a bit strange, really. And to be honest, we didn't even know um, until 18 weeks. Wow. Um, anyway, so I'd sort of done half of it without even knowing, really. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's been a little bit strange. do feel like I've missed out on quite a lot, um, a lot of hospital appointments and classes and, and whatnot that you would usually go to. But right. they've been really good. Um, NHS really looks after you over here. So have regular checkups and scans and appointments and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, yeah, not long to go and couple more hospital visits and then and should be should be there wow uh talking about um the pregnancy you competed in the world bulls tour while pregnant uh yep. playing exceptionally well um i watched the whole thing i've been i've been following you on the world board tours for for some time i've always been fascinated with young players coming up and uh when i heard the story that uh, you're competing Pregnant, I know that you're you're an excellent player and have won a ton of titles on there. Uh, what was it like com competing while you were pregnant? It was really strange, actually, because um, a lot of people have said, sort of, did you feel off balance or or did your delivery feel different? And the answer was yes, but I think it was made worse by the fact that I haven't been able to play through it because um, majority of people you sort of play from start to finish and don't really notice whether you've got any bigger or whether your delivery's changed um, sort of week on week or if you play two or three games a week then I guess you just sort of change and adapt to it but but for me it was going from not playing at all to playing seven months pregnant wow. yeah. um, and it was typical as well because I, I literally had no bump um, probably start of January um, and then he decided that he was going to properly stick himself out just in time for potters. <laughs> um, so it was interesting. It certainly took some concentration um, and probably just checking I could actually bowl and bend down first before anything. But yeah, it, it was uncomfortable for some games, um, probably dependent on the time of the game uh, more than anything. But yeah, certainly a different experience. Um, so what is bowls like in England? Uh, I know here in Canada, we have like our typical club and local events where we have tournaments and like little jitney sort of things. I'm just curious what it's like over there. Yeah. So we, similar to you, we sort of play all out of clubs. Um, generally indoors, you have national titles, um, which you play off during the season. Um, so start in sort of September time and play them off and then national finals are in March sort of time. Um, if you play in the World Bowls Tour as well, which is obviously a different um, organisation, that's all held at Potters in January. Um, so there are little little tournaments sort of here, there and everywhere and there's an open singles that runs as well alongside everything else. Um, and then outdoors is is a little bit different um so you play all your county competitions which are just sort of in your area um sort of yourself and surrounding clubs in in different areas um which then take you through to national finals um which are held sort of june july august time um probably again with little tournaments here and there um so probably fairly similar um to you guys really yeah, definitely sounds pretty similar. Um, how how would you say the competition level is just on an average across everybody? Um, is it pretty pretty tough all the time? Or yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, um, probably 
you play indoors maybe obviously varies from area to area dependent on entry numbers um but probably play up to sort of 12 games to win a national title um and then outdoors tends to be a little bit more um once you get through um to to national finals probably a few more rounds outdoors but yeah it's pretty tough to win a national so uh you're talking about indoors we we don't have a we only have really one indoor facility here in Canada, but uh, the World Bowls Tour is so heavy in UK players, Wales, Scotland, England, uh, for instance. Uh, how how prevalent is indoor bowls in the UK and, and how, uh, I guess, how many players are, or how big are the clubs there for indoors? Um, I think it's quite well. That's quite a, a heavy subject, really, because obviously during the pandemic, um, we have seen quite a few clubs over England um, um, have to unfortunately close down due to funding or not being able to run or whatnot. Um, I think generally there are a lot more clubs outdoors um, than indoors. Um, I know we're quite lucky. There are quite a few indoor clubs in our area. Um, sort of around here but then you get some counties that you go to where there's just one club um, so it really does depend whereabouts in the country you are but I think on the whole there are probably more bowls clubs um, outdoors than there are indoors uh, you uh, you actually mentioned the pandemic a little bit there I'm just curious when you were at uh, your most recent event there at Potter's how did you uh, feel the safety protocols well especially being an expecting mother Oh, it was brilliant. Potters and the World Bowls Tour both covered literally everything that they could have done. Um, I think the World Bowls Tour spent hours and hours and hours having to plan all COVID sort of regimental um, procedures and make sure everybody had their own room, had their own bubbles, um, sort of dependent on who you were playing with and against, which was obviously really difficult because you don't know who you're playing with or against in different rounds. Um, so they sort of bubbled us up at the start, dependent on who your first round draw was against. Um, but I filled in for Darren Burnett in the pairs um, due to his injury um, with Stuart. So obviously was in with Stuart to start with, Stuart Anderson, and then came out of that and played the singles. But because I was in every event, it was really difficult. But they were so good, like around the resort in general. Um, there was hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, the bar was all laid out so everyone really could have their own table. Um, but they, they literally covered everything. So it felt really safe. That's that's awesome. I know when uh, the news came out that two people had actually uh, tested positive, and you didn't really hear anything else. There, there's always that wonder of like, oh, you know, is is something going to happen? Are there more people? So it's really good to hear that uh, the protocols were great and you felt really, really safe. What what was it like playing with nobody there, really? <laughs> it was a, it was weird, like really, really odd because you're used to obviously having the big crowd. Um, and, and I think it you just had to coming from not playing at all it it was as if you were starting again, and I certainly felt like concentration was such a massive thing because we haven't played competitive bowls for so long um it was not only hard to sort of get into a competitive environment straight away, which is so intense as the world bowls tour, and like every round you're playing is a really difficult opponent you know it's it's the top level bowls. But let alone with no crowd, no noise whatsoever, you literally just had the cameras up the side, um, a black curtain, and then the the BBC crew and the umpires. So I certainly found it really, really difficult to sort of focus. Um, normally, I would sort of have a, a glance around the crowd. Uh, noises and, and movement don't really bother me at all, but you could literally hear and see everything. So it was really different atmosphere to, I think, what any of us were used to. Uh, for the the WBT, you you won at such an early age. Uh, I think it was eighteen, was it that you yeah. won your first WBT uh, BT title? Um, yeah, it was. What was that experience like, and and what do you attribute to your? I'll say like a fast rise. You don't usually hear age eighteen and World Bowls <laughs> to a title in the same sentence. Um, so what was it like winning that first one, and and what do you attribute to your, your quick rise in bowls? Um, 
I think it's, it's hard, really, because for me, I, I've, I've been sort of attending national finals since the age of 13, really. Um, and I represented England um, both indoors and outdoors from quite a young age. Um, so I didn't maybe think, oh, this is at my depth or on another level or anything like that. And then when I obviously won it, people were like, oh, she's only 18. Um, but I actually went through the qualifiers. So the, the ladies' event used to be an invitation-only event. Um, and then they introduced a qualifying option, um, which I went to. That was immensely difficult. I think I played six games at the qualifying event, all really strong opposition to get through. Um and then just sort of turned up really not knowing what to expect. Never played on the portable carpet before, but always watched it. Um, and just sort of felt really at home. Um, just sort of took each game as it, it came and then obviously managed to yeah, to uh, to manage to win it. But um, it was brilliant, like an amazing experience up against the crowd. The TV really took some getting used to. I stood in front of the camera numerous times and got told to move. Um, I think that it is a completely different experience to what you're used to. Um, but yeah, I've just loved it and I've loved being at Pars every year since. So it's a, it's a privilege, really. So this last uh, World Bowls Tour, I believe it was the first event that was open. Yeah, so it's the, the open singles has always been an open event. Okay. Um, and I think there's, I think there's been a few ladies who have qualified in the past. Um, I know Julie Forrest has qualified before, um, Carol Ashby, um, and probably a, a few others as well. Um, but yeah, it's obviously top sixteen and then ranking list and qualifiers and whatnot. So the only way you'd get in, sort of as a as a female, was to qualify. And I'm I'm pretty sure there's only been a few that have done that before. So um, yeah, it was quite different this year, being open or more open than um, than before. Um, so with that being said, what was that like uh, being able to play against and actually defeat uh, Alex Marshall, especially uh, being seven <laughs> seven and a half months pregnant? Yeah, that's a question I've been asked a lot since actually. Yeah, um, yeah it was it was amazing. You know, I, I played the first round and played all right, just sort of scrapped through a win. Um, and then went up in the commentary box with Anne Dunwoody afterwards to do a little interview. And she said, oh, who have you got next? So I said, uh, the one that nobody wants. And she said, oh, who's that? So I said, it's, it's Alex Marshall in the second round. And she was like, oh, that's, you know, that's that's not really a draw that's ideal for anyone, is it? And I said, no, if you were going to pick anyone that you wouldn't want to play out of that um, field, it'd definitely be Alex. But um, I get on really well with Alex. I've got so much time and respect for him. I've played... Um, in his team that he captained for the rest of the world team against the Australians in Moama um, a couple of years ago. And he is such a lovely guy. Um, and in my opinion, the best in the world. Um, so, yeah, to go on there and, and um, play against him, I I don't really normally get nervous. Um, but I just sort of <laughs> sort of went into it thinking, well, I hope I score. I hope I don't get nilled. Um, and then it ended up being an absolute cracker of a game. It, it was fun to watch for sure uh yeah and mm -hmm. congratulations on that i i think i've interviewed a few other people and every time they say you know who's your toughest it's like alex marshall or on any yeah. surface really yeah um talking about that you're you had such a quick turnaround into the the ladies final the match play final um it seemed really weird that you went from back-to-back -back games I mean, you're, you're dealing with being pregnant in a pandemic, all this other kind of stuff. Uh, did that have an effect on on your, your finals matchup being such a quick turnaround? Yeah, it, it was it wasn't easy um, at all. I had I think on the commentary, it was said that I was given the choice whether I played two games on the bounce, but I wasn't. Um, I knew a couple of days in advance that that would be the case, that if I was to um, get through the first round of the singles, it would be scheduled for the ladies' final after that, which is fine. It is what it is, you know. Um, but, yeah, I think it was more mentally draining than physically um, coming off after playing Alex, you know, whether I'd I'd won like I did or I'd got completely thumped against him that still would have been the same sort of 20 minute break 
start again, start a completely new game. And I think the first set I was completely running on adrenaline, um, <laughs> more so than anything else after playing Alex. Um, and then second set, you know, I, it's so hard to regroup after the first set anyway, winning it comfortably, you then have to sort of start again. And I'd almost prefer to have scrapped through the first set than won it comfortably. Um, but yeah, Laura came back against me in the second set and pretty much did what I did to her in the first. So, you know, it's sets as anyone's. Um, and then you go to a tie break and, and she played a perfect tie break. So can't really complain. Yeah. Uh, what has the media been like towards all of your uh, your achievements and uh, the great storyline here? Um, have you received a lot of uh, requests for press? No, I I did a few local bits um, on the on the news and whatnot, um, and did a an interview for Bowls England as well um, on the game. But on the whole, I don't think Bowls gets enough coverage. Obviously, there was last year. I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but there was quite a lot done on Nicky Brett's Wonder Bowl, yeah. um, which Nicky himself says wasn't actually that good. Um, but I don't think there's enough in general done to promote the sport um, coverage-wise, whether it's telly, radio, anything like that. I know quite a few of us locally get to, or are asked to do a few bits of radio, um, a few bits of telly, but on the whole, I think it, it bowls could be televised and represented in the media so much better than it is. I think I, I don't think I could have said it any better myself. Uh, one thing we try to do with this show is um, showcase people, give news stories. Um, and one of the reasons we really wanted to have you on was for that very reason. It, it was such an amazing storyline to watch uh, through that whole event. Um, you know, Alex Marshall, uh, the whole bit. So we, we absolutely wanted to have you on the show, and we were so delighted when, when you decided to come on and, yeah. and do this. Uh, talking about that, where, where you've had so much success, and I mean, uh, especially this last round, do you think that there is much of a gap between the level of women's bowls and men's bowls? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think there is, even though you, you wouldn't want to admit that there is. Um, it, it's a really difficult one because hopefully, you know, Potters and, and what happened with it being more open and there being, due to unfortunate circumstances, really more ladies in the open draw, hopefully that will have really pushed it to, to the forefront that there are ladies that can compete against the men. Not, not many. And, you know, I'll admit that myself, that there aren't many, but... Um, there are certainly a few that can compete with the top men and the, and the top 16 um, in the, involved in the World Bowls Tour are 16 of the best in the world. I don't think that can be argued. Obviously, you'd put um, a lot of the Australians, um, Ryan Bester, some of the Canadians, um, some of the New Zealanders as well up there if you were picking you know, your, your top 16 in the world. Right. Um, but it all depends on people's circumstances, whether they can obviously play in the events or not. Um, but, yeah, I think, it's, I think it is a difficult one to touch on. And I think there is definitely an argument that women should want to compete against the men. And, and sadly, a lot of time they don't. Um, there are a few that you sort of say, well, you know, why don't you give it a go? And the philosophy is, well, we'll never beat them. We'll, we won't be as good as the men. But, you know, if you don't try, you're not going to get there, are you? So I think the fact that myself, Ellen and Julie put on a, fairly decent show i think at potters will hopefully um promote women's sport or women in the in the sport a lot a lot better yeah um it it was it was interesting um to see that change of events were, were you surprised uh when you got uh, picked to go into that open slot yeah, and I think it was really difficult for the World Bowls Tour as well. And I got, I know they got a lot of stick um, and a lot of people that actually kicked up a bit of a, a fuss about us being put into the draw. But, you know, like with the coronavirus and the situation, we were all tested um, shortly after Christmas and in the build-up to actually travel into Potters. And there is no way that the World Bowls Tour could have said with a week to go, you know, all right, Nikki and Darren have decided that they're not playing in the event. We're going to put 
two qualifiers in or we're going to put two more people that are down the ranking list that haven't been tested. Right. And obviously it, it was good for us that we were involved. Not good that Nikki and Darren were obviously injured and couldn't play. Um, but I think they, they made the best out of the situation that they could have done. Um, and it, it certainly helped us, you know, from a women in sport point of view. Um, and I, I think it was a... It was a good decision, keeping safety at the forefront more than anything. So um, <clears throat> do you feel that uh, women get their fair shake in the sport? Like, obviously, um, like you said before, we hear uh, more about the, the big top bowlers being the men. Uh, I'm just curious uh, if you think uh, if it's a fair shake or not. Um, I don't think it, I don't think women should be involved in it just because they're a woman. Like uh, maybe you could you could argue that it should be a mixed event, but then at the same time, my my look is if if you're good enough to be there, it doesn't matter what whether you're male or female. Um, and if you think you're good enough to be there, then prove it. Um, you know, it, there shouldn't be however many women spots available. I, I wouldn't feel happy, certainly not going in because I was female. Um, I'd rather qualify against five six men and get my place in there rather than be put in because, you know, it has to be a mixed event. Um, but that doesn't say that there will never be a female winner of it. That doesn't say that you can go into competitions and, and men are always going to come out, you know, on top. But if you're good enough, it, it really doesn't, for me, matter whether you're male or female. Well said, yeah. <laughs> uh, shifting over to uh, another big event, World Bowls 2020. Uh, you were named to the team, and obviously, uh, if anybody's been following the news, it's been postponed and delayed and postponed again, and the dates have, have shifted quite a bit. Um, how excited were you to initially be selected to the World Bulls team for England, and then how has it been trying to deal with just these constant moving target dates? It's been really hard. Um, I think the excitement of being involved in it and picked in the initial squad um, was just like, yes, we're going to Australia again. I absolutely love Broad Beach, love playing bowls in, in Australia. So for me, it's, it's a dream every time I get to go over there. Um, but then for it to obviously all be cancelled and the selection process to have started again, um, all of the planning and the uncertainty has been really, really hard to deal with from probably a, a training perspective we haven't been allowed to play bowls um but yeah just just really hard to process really you look forward to an event and and gear yourself up for it and then all of a sudden it's cancelled and you've you've almost got to start again really so yeah really hard how tough is the selection process over in england yeah, it's difficult, really difficult. We have a lot of camps um, and a lot of weekends and a lot of training time um, for the selection process. So you, you have really got to prove yourself. Um, we're linked up with Loughborough University, um, who are working really, really hard to um, sort of psychology-wise and fitness-wise get us ready and prepared for the games and whatnot, whether it's the Commonwealth or Worlds again. Um We've had a few weekends where, obviously, you're scored and marked on everything. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's fairly gruelling um, and fairly tough to get through. So, so Catherine, you're only 25. You have a pretty impressive uh, a resume already with your Commonwealth Games success mm -hmm. and your success in the World Bowls Tour. Uh, what's next for you? Just hopefully getting back to bowls, really. Um, <laughs> it's hard to know, really, isn't it? We're we're certainly optimistic about our outdoor season um, going ahead. And I know our competitions start pretty much in May um, outdoors. So I think everyone's fairly optimistic with the with the guidance that we've been given that we'll be allowed to play again um, coming up into May. But I, I think it's just look forward to whatever's being run run next really and getting back to it hopefully like to win a few more titles and get back to australia um and obviously the commonwealth games coming up as well and selection for that so I, I think it's just get back on the green as soon as possible but what are you what is your guys plan are, are you restricted for for playing at the moment or how's it working yeah we we're in restriction um our province ontario in canada uh is one of the the heavier hit ones in the yeah. in the country 
Um, so we're in lockdown. Some other provinces are a little uh, better off, but pretty much everybody is just waiting for the vaccines to roll out. And we're crossing our fingers that we, we can open yeah. our clubs and play a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the same for everyone, really, isn't it? Just cross your fingers and hope. Yeah. And the news is never super positive. There's always something bad in the news about the pandemic. So you got yeah. to just be hopeful, I guess. Have you um, had many vaccines or, or many people been vaccinated yet? Or I think it, it's been mostly a slow rollout for us. Um, yeah. Our, our long term care and, and nursing homes and uh, uh, older generation has been uh, taken care of first, obviously, uh, like most countries. Um, for, for people like us, we're, we're kind of on the, the low tier, the waiting list, just waiting to, uh, to hear when yeah. those next levels of vaccination will actually roll out. Yeah, similar to us by the sounds of it. Yeah, that's that's what it's been like. Um, you mentioned Commonwealth Games. And uh, I think just recently, it might have been even a few days ago, uh, it seemed like they rolled out the full schedule, um, mm. everything going on. How excited are you to have that event in England? Oh, it's brilliant. Hopefully, you know, having a home games and, and fingers crossed and for selection processes and, and, and you know, for, for selection for that. Um, but to have the games at home is, is brilliant, both for the sport, I think, and obviously for us being a home nation. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to play on the Gold Coast and, and seeing how the home crowd reacted to, to the Aussies on the green. Mm -hmm. And bowls over there is is a completely different kettle of fish. You know, you had people that had had tickets for the rugby, I think, sat behind my mum and dad when they were out there, never watched bowls before, like never been to, to live bowls before, and they absolutely loved it. And I think that was why it's so well received in Australia, that they're so sort of up for anything and getting involved with, with any sport. And, um, you know, fingers crossed that will be the same in Birmingham, um, and the exposure of the sport and the tickets that will be up for grabs for it will be just a way of promoting it really to people that don't know what bowls is about or have never seen it live before and just want some tickets for the games really um, I think they're promoting it really well by um, everything that we've heard media wise um, so so yeah hopefully get a lot of coverage on the telly and, and everyone get behind us as a home nation really Awesome yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so uh, obviously you're going to put yourself uh, forward for, for selection for that. Um, you seem hopeful. Um, how do you think uh, having a growing family is going to interfere with your bowls? I mean, you have a break now while it's going on, mm -hmm. but uh, what kind of future do you see with yourself there? Yeah, I think it'll be fine. You know, there's, there's quite a few of us that are in the selection process that are going to have young children. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and sort of family support is a big thing. You know, if you play bowls, you have to have the support of your family um, and, and whatnot because, you know, if you, if you didn't, they'd be like, and you were going out every night to bowls, you know, they'd, they'd wonder what you were off to. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think it'll be absolutely fine. You know, my hope is just to get back on the green as, as quick as possible. Um, and, yeah, take it, take it as I would sort of planned beforehand. I think everything's been a bit up in the air and that probably adds to it a little bit. So, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. Well, Luke, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I don't think I do. Cool. Well, Catherine, um, I can say uh, you're an amazing ambassador for the sport, especially for <laughs> England. Um, the interview today was, uh, was fantastic. Uh, I love to get your perspective on these things. As I said, I've been following your career for a while through the World Bowls tour and what we can get here in Canada. And I think uh, you're just an inspiration to, to young females, especially in the sport and what they can do and where they can go. And uh, I mean, it was just a, a friendly, nice chat that we had here. So it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day. You too. Take care. Take care. We're back, Carol. Yeah. Uh, what an interview. Yeah, it was a great one. I, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed listening to it as much as I did uh, doing that interview. It was a good one. Yeah. Um, 
for for anybody who doesn't know who uh Catherine is there's there's your first look um she like we said she's a great ambassador for uh, for women in the sport um an inspiration for any of those going up she won a world bulls tour title at 18. she's only 25 and has been to the commonwealth games won multiple titles at the world bulls tour um been selected to uh england's top team which uh isn't an easy thing to do either and um i mean beating alex marshall is is a feather in anybody's cap so uh she's she's done a ton yeah absolutely uh if you're listening uh catherine thanks again for uh for doing that interview with us uh, we really do appreciate it and uh good luck with the rest of your pregnancy i guess there's not much left now but uh good luck <laughs> have fun yeah uh we, we kind of chatted a little bit after the the interview was done and um obviously uh, i'm expecting a kid shortly uh, we're just a, a couple months behind her and i'm i'm starting Oof. to make plans for where am i gonna go what's my bulls stuff gonna do coaching work all that kind of stuff so i can imagine what she's going through especially being you know trying to get to that top tier uh, uh team yeah absolutely well, Daryl, I think it's about time to wander down. We've been going here for over an hour. It's <laughs> yeah. a long, long, long time. Uh, unless you have something else you want to talk about. I don't. Uh, I, I think that was a great show. Um, really good topics. Thanks, everybody, for being in chat. Uh, we really appreciate everybody being here, as always. Yeah, well, like we said at the start of the show, guys, uh, if you did miss the start of it, everything's available. It'll be reposted on YouTube right after the show. It's available on all podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, all the fun ones, all the whatever. They're all, it's all <laughs> out there. Um, remember to like, comment, subscribe. It really does mean a lot to us. Um, we're on well on our way to our goal of 1,000 subscribers. We're slowly, slowly climbing up, but it's going quicker than expected. So thanks, everyone, for uh, subscribing and coming back every week. Uh, I guess we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Uh, keep your eyes out for the uh, Canadian Bowler After Dark that should be coming down the pipe here shortly. Yep. Nothing lined up as of today, but uh, we are planning on having one of those here in the near future. Um, yeah, and I guess that's it. So until next time, guys, I hope that all your bowls are touchers, and uh, have a great weekend.